Welcome to the Dear Doc Podcast, where we will discuss the business of running a dental practice with a panel of experts. Now, your host, Dr. Christopher Hoffpower. Hey guys, it's Doc Hoffpower coming to you again from my recording studio here in Alvin, Texas. Uh, I'd like to say thank you for joining us for another episode of the Dear Doc Podcast. Today, we have a really special guest. You know, a lot of times we talk about um, dentistry from the outside with the, you know, people who do HR, people who are brokers, or people who are experts in insurance. Well, today we're going to talk to a dentist who has gone through it all from private practice to owning a large group practice to getting out and finally selling. And I think he'd be a great resource for a lot of us to learn a little bit more about the business of dentistry. And that is Joe Mao. Mayo. Mayo. I keep wanting to chant Mao. That's Mayo. Right. <laughs> so Joe Mayo. Yeah, I, yeah. I swear we didn't plan this, but I, I kind of told him I was going to do that. Yeah. So talk to me a little bit about uh, who you are and tell everyone why you're here and how we met. Yeah, so it's well. First of all, thanks, Doc. It's 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 a definitely a pleasure to uh, speak with you again. Uh, you know, you and I re, uh, actually just met a couple weeks ago. It was um, I uh, I had the luxury of selling off my dental practices uh, a couple months ago, and uh, you know I just started reaching out to some other professionals and and started seeing some things across uh, Facebook, and I saw what you were doing, and so I reached out to you to find out a little bit more about you and kind of who you are, but. Yeah, d- dentistry is it's been a great ride for me. I've uh, I've really enjoyed it. Um I graduated uh back in 2005 from Creighton University. Uh had no dreams growing up of being a dentist by any means. I right. I I had thought about uh being a baseball player, but I just didn't have the talent to to go beyond a college level and uh I was dating my dentist's daughter at the time and you know, I'd thought about going into physical therapy. I'd thought about going into some kind of medicine. And he said, you know, don't, don't do that. Go into dentistry. And I'm like, oh, that's just disgusting. I'm not going <laughs> to. And, uh, you know, but I, I always enjoyed working with people and working with my hands. And uh, so I took the, uh, the DAT and luckily got in. And, and uh, so, you know, that was my quick intro to dentistry. But then my freshman year of dental school uh, is actually when 9-11 happened. And uh, I thought about getting out of dentistry. I, I almost dropped out. I was actually going to go into uh, the Marines. Um, I well, I, I'm friends. really, I'm really glad you did, and I would have missed out on a great friendship. Yeah, no, this it's you know all, all paths lead to something, right? And, Absolutely. Uh, um, you know, I it was an emotional time. I was engaged at the time, uh, not to my dentist daughter. This is a different <laughs> woman. And uh, you know, we decided, look, you know, it, it would be best to. Uh, uh, just kind of let the emotions, t- you know, go down. And if a year you're still feeling the same way, let, let's do it. And right. so then after a year, I'm like, okay, I can, I can serve in another capacity. And that was by being a dentist in the air force. And so, uh, I graduated, went and just learned and it was kind of a fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth year of dental school for me, uh, mm-hmm. in the air force. Uh, but j- just phenomenal people. I was basically making sure that, uh, um, people were smiling when they were dropping bombs and uh, <laughs> t- t- taking care of their families. And well, there's uh, some really, there's some really great things to recommend that program. Uh, first of all, as a, as a previous army guy, I have to pick on you about doing your two miles on a bicycle. Two, <laughs> I, I, I never, two miles on a bicycle. I, I never had to do that in the, in the, oh. in the air force. Oh, for our, for our fitness test, we had to run two miles. So the joke was always that the air force does it on a bicycle. Yeah, it, it was the chair force, you know, that was the thing. Yeah, it, it's, uh, I, I took the path because it, it uh, one, they actually, uh, um, the, the resources that they had, they, they enabled me to uh, uh, actually get a little bit more money and it was just better Absolutely. than the family move. And it was, it was a great path for you. And, you know, in addition to that, in addition to just the um, saving money on, on tuition, which I think would appeal to a lot of our listeners, uh, there are great opportunities to learn specialty work in, in the military. Oh, it, it, it was the, the year I graduated dental school, I, I did an AEGD. Um, and that AEGD, I mean, I, I had an oral surgeon holding my hands. I had an orthodontist holding my hands. I mean, they were literally right there by the side and they'd say, 
okay, here, here's how we take out a wisdom tooth. Here's how we do it. I, I would encourage any new doc, if they have the capacity to be able to uh, get into an AGD, you know, I mean, it, your, your program being the business of dentistry, right? first thing definitely people want to do is they want to get their own house in order. And if you're able to provide other services to other people, you know, quicker, it's, it's, it's a fantastic thing. It, it, it just, it enables your, your growth to happen. So, you know, I, I, I definitely attribute my AGD to, you know, so I didn't have to refer out the procedures. I didn't right. refer out the surgeries. I didn't refer out the implants or the, uh, all of those other things. And, you know, it wasn't go learn from another doc and have a failed associateship and, you know, go out and try to figure things out on my own. Uh, the, the military was incredible because I was so, I was able to learn so much about leadership. Absolutely. Because the business of dentistry isn't just about, you know, doing good. Reading, reading a P&L, right? It's, yeah. it's also about being a, a leader. Now, we, it's something we discussed a, a few moments ago. So, now, Joe, this is a point in the, sto- in, the, uh, in the story where I like to jump forward and then we'll jump backwards again. Okay. So the reason you guys should be listening to Joe um, is because he has uh, had quite a, a meteoric rise. And um, he – tell us a little bit about – you got out of, you got out of, um, out of dental, school, uh, dental school. You went into the military. You're, you're in dental school. You went into the military. You finished up after. Yep. Then you get out of the military – and you're looking for your first job. I believe it was your first. And you find yep. this guy who's looking for a partner. Mm-hmm. And you said, what the hell? Let's make a go of it. Yep. And what you found very early is even though he was an amazing dentist, an amazing person, he just didn't think of business as business. Is, is that fair to say? It, it, it is fair. Yeah. I mean, and I think he had, you know, the standard owner mindset of like, hey, I'm going to do this. I'm going I'm to venture on my own but he had the kindest heart in the world and, and not saying that I don't have a kind heart, but you know, I've always thought of it as if you're going to be able to serve more people, you, you've got to be able to do the things that a business requires. You right. know, you and I have talked about that business is created for two reasons, you know, make profit and make a difference. And, Absolutely. and, and in order to make more of a difference, you've got to make more of a profit. Agree. And, and I, and I think that's one of the struggles that we face in dentistry is for some reason, we think that it's enough to just do good dental work. It's enough to just treat people right. You know, un- unfortunately, it's not. I mean, you've got to be a steward Absolutely. over your business, and that, that will enable you to have a more fulfilling, more impactful life all around. Well, you, you once asked me what I thought was the biggest lie told in dentistry, and I answered, it was the field of dreams. If you build it, they will come. Mm-hmm. Being the best dentist with the best margins around is no guarantee of success. In oh. fact, for most people, most people who concentrate on that, I, I would say it's almost a guarantee of failure Yeah, because they're not concentrating on the things that allow them to continue doing that. Mm-hmm. So, Joe, you, you, you land this partnership. Mm-hmm. What state was the business in whenever you, whenever you got there? So I, we're, this state, so state defined two ways. So number one, the state, it was in the state of Utah, but as far as like the condition, <laughs> the condition that the practice was in is it, it was a failing practice. Um, and you know, I, I would tell my previous business partner to this day, uh, it, it was an absolute mess. Um, he had scratch started one from practice or, or, or from start. And uh, he had put an associate in place. This associate was uh, running it to the ground. Um, he had actually gone to start another one with a medical practice. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when I, when I found him, a uh, very just good-hearted guy, I just thought, hey, look, you know, wh- what is it that you're looking for? And this is kind of where my skills are. And he's like, you know, you can come join me in this practice. Um, this other practice I have, it's just kind of a junk practice. It's running it into the ground. And so, I'm, and then I just asked him literally simple. I'm just like, Hey, you know, do you mind if I take a look at the numbers? Right. And uh, he's like, no, not at all. And you know, it, it was so nice of him. He, he basically opened up his books and I'm like, you know, is, that's a scary thing. And that, that speaks to just how genuine and cool this guy is. Yeah. That's a scary thing for anyone. I don't like people looking at my books. You yeah. Know? So well, he, he was trying to get me into his business, right? Like he, and, and that's what I asked him. I'm like, you know, if we're going to be partnering up and, you know, potentially doing these things, I, I got to know something about it. I, 
I'm a guy that likes to try to take the emotions out of it as much as I can. And you can right. only do that when you're looking at the metrics. Absolutely. So that brings us to a really important question before we progress on the rest of the story. You talk about walking into this practice and valuating it. And you said it was a failing practice. Mm-hmm. Now, a lot of people say, oh, what are the new patient numbers or what is the gross production or what is there are any number of things that the average dentist will look at and say, this means failure or success. In my experience, there's about five or six numbers you really need to look at, and they tell a story together. None of them tell the story by themselves. Sure. So what are your numbers that you look at? What are your metrics that you believe in? And what did you use to evaluate this practice when you walked into it? So yeah. talk, talk to us about that. Yeah, and number one thing I look at, you know, measure success is, do you make any money? You know, I mean, like, mm-hmm. as far as like, we're talking financial, I mean, sure, you can be successful in treating a lot of patients, have, having a, you know, impact of employing people and doing these things. But that, that's really only going to last so long if you're not actually making any money. Right. Okay. And, now, are we talking Dr. Sal or are we talking, or are we talking I'm, I'm talking about just practice profitability. And, and, and okay. you can make, you can make a P&L look any way you want to. I mean, like, that's the thing. I, I, it's, it's one of those things like, okay, you know, if, am, I, am I looking from a taxation standpoint or am, I, or am I looking at creating this P&L so I can go borrow some money from a bank, you right. know? And so, you know, you obviously want to look at production and collections. You want to look at new patient numbers. I, I personally like to look at trends. You know, what's it done over the last quarter? What's it done over the last year? What's it done over the last three years? Or if I'm starting from scratch, I'm looking at dem- demographics, right? You know, I, I want to know how many people live in a certain area. Um, you know, I would like to have, um, you know, 30,000 houses within maybe a six mile radius or 30,000 individuals that, that, that I can treat. Right. Um, you know, new patients, what's their trend? I mean, I, I bought practices, um, you know, cause, cause we got up to eight practices and, and I mm. ended up selling them off at six of them were general dental, two of them were orthodontics. Um, you know, I bought one practice, uh, from a guy, he was getting nine patients a month and it was, you know, he was producing, I think he was like in the mid four hundreds. Mm-hmm. And by the time we sold it, we had just barely, uh, just were just shy of a million dollars is right. what we got it up to. So it wasn't the most fantastic practice from, from doing it, but the potential was definitely, definitely there. And so production collection, new patient numbers. Um, I look at areas where we can save money, you know, are they overstaffed? And so, mm-hmm. you know, that's, that's where I look at the, uh, um, you know, the P and L's is there, is, you know, so many times their expenses are out of control. Maybe they have a bunch of inventory sitting on their shelves and, you know, they're, they're spending 9% on supplies. Um, you know, it's literally as basic as you've got income and you've got expenses. Yeah. How can I improve the income? How can I decrease the expenses so that margin's better for you? And again, you're looking for levers and dials. What, what are the yeah. big levers you can throw to make the 80% of change? And yeah. then you dial things in over the rest of the time. Yeah. Yeah. Can, can, you, can you literally increase the income by adding additional procedures? Right. By adding hours, by expanding, you know, even the space and equipment. And so, you know, I, I'm a big believer, Doc, in keeping it as simple as possible. So when people are evaluating a practice, whether it's a startup or whether it's a, a, a new one, P and L's are an absolute must. Your right. st- your standard reports that uh, your dental software will put out mm-hmm. production. But but here's the thing: numbers are only as good as the person inputting them. Right. Because I, I I've bought a practice and the guy's like, <clears throat> oh, you know, we're getting 50 new patients a month. Well, let's take a look at your books and you go and count right. them at like 38. Right. So, so due diligence is huge. Diligence. And, you know, and that's one of the things that I find, and I think that people don't realize, the reports in any kind of dental practice management software, uh, there are usually two to three reports that will get you the same data, and they're all pulled in different ways. Yep. And so um, the, the algorithm that's used a lot of times uh, can really affect how accurate that number is. But you're, you're talking about, um, you're talking about P&Ls. There's an old joke. There's an advertisement for a, for a mathematician. So this physicist goes in and they say, hey, what is, uh, what is four divided by two? And he says two. Mm-hmm. And then an engineer comes up and he says, uh, what is four divided by two? And he says, well, it's 1.9888971. And 
and springs it off to 30 digits. Statistician comes in and says, what is four divided by two? He says, what do you want it to be? What do you want, right? <laughs> and that's kind of the P&L, right? <laughs> it, it, depending on what you list is what, it, you can make it look in, in a variety of different ways. Yeah, yeah. I, I look at the potential and I, I look at it's like, okay, here, here's, here's what I know to be true. Here's how I think the practices should be run. Here's, what, here's the value I can do. But I'm also looking at what's the real asset we're buying. You know, right. what's, the, what's, what's the potential? And so the assets are the people. You know, are these people under-trained? Do we need to train them up? Are they going to fit in the new culture that we bring? Right. And, you know, a lot of times uh, people don't want to fit the new culture. A lot, a lot right. of times they, uh, they're not used to being productive members of society. And so, you know, are you willing to make the strong decisions to, uh, that the business needs to make it successful? And if you're not, then don't buy it. Absolutely. There's, there's a, um, a management company or several of them that uh, teach the L. Ron Hubbard management style. And I bring that up because of where you're from. Okay. Um, so you know, it's funny as you say that, and I, I stay in my own bubble. Tell me more <laughs> about it. I, I, I'm, I well, they, they say that there are people who are willing and people who are unwilling. And people who are unwilling are, are of no worldly good. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the way you can tell them is because they are people who are covertly hostile. Uh, and it, it, there's a whole bunch of stuff. We'll talk about it off, off, off camera because some of it's yeah. kind of wacky, a lot like L. Ron Hubbard was. Yeah. <laughs> but they, there, there's a lot of really good, juicy um, tidbits you can pull out of that. And one is willing versus unwilling. If a person isn't willing, they're not trainable. They're, they're yeah. simply yeah. not. But I think a lot of doctors make the mistake of holding on to people who are unwilling or people who don't share their vision for way too long and they're, they're sure. poison. They, they, they destroy the practice from within. There, there's certain things you can negotiate with. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm a big believer in, in people. I, I think that people have shown the right way and inspired in the manner that they want to be inspired in. I, 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 I want to give people the benefit of the doubt. You know, if, if they're acting some way, it's usually because of their experiences or, someone has allowed them to get away with that for a certain time. Right. And, you know, it's, you always want people, you you can never expect someone to do something you haven't taught them to do. And, you know, I, I've talked to dentists, I've talked to doctors and they get so mad at their staff. Oh, my team member's not doing this or my associate's not doing that. And I'm like, well, how much, how much time have you actually spent creating them? I mean, I, I so completely agree. You, to plug one of my own things here, you know, I own part of PK performance, which provides online training for dental team members. I totally agree. You know, if in the military, we learned if there's not an SOP, there needs to be one. Right. right? (laughs) Yeah. You have to write down everything. How do you you sweep the floor? How do you do this? Yep. Yep. But it's, it's, it's true though. And and everything needs to be written on a sixth grade level. Mm -hmm. And, And that's the only way that you can actually train people in a duplicatable fashion. You may have a rock store, who is just a training guru and they, they walk into a room full of people who have never taken an x-ray and they walk out and all of a sudden you've got a room full of highly qualified dental assistants yep. in someone's fantasy world. But <laughs> that doesn't really happen. What, what really happens is you got to break down the job into chunks and you have to have a real job description. You've right. got to tell people what it is you expect from them or they can't give it no matter how, how willful they are to provide you what it is you're paying them for. If you never tell them what that is, they can't do it. Well, and it's, and it's not to be insulting to them. It's, it's right. literally just to provide the communication for people of these are my expectations. I am, I am hiring you and paying you to do X. Right. I'm writing it down so you understand it. And there's, there's, it just provides that method of, so because of miscommunication, if there's ever a problem in, in any dental practice, there's a miscommunication somewhere. And usually right. it's because someone's trying to talk and the other person's not listening, you know, two ears, one mouth, whole thing. Right. And so, you know, it, and, and a lot of it's just, okay, so you've got this rock star person that's training these dental assistants. Well, what happens, you know, to not be too morbid here, but what happens if she does walk out of the office and gets struck by the bus? What it, what it, or, or more? You're, you're picking on me about my notes thing. I see. I see. Right. <laughs> but, but more likely, you know, like w- what happens if uh, you know they need to leave? Maybe their spouse gets another job. Uh, Absolutely. Maybe, you know, maybe. Uh, and you start over from nothing. You start over from zero. 
Well, life, life happens, right? Exactly. Life, life happens. And there's going to be turnover in our industry. There, it's it's going to happen. And whether you want it to or not, um, and you just want the, the clear thing, you want, you want your business, and you and I have spoken about this before, like, like an e-myth, you want your business to be able to run without you being there. You want to Absolutely. be able to make money without you having to do wear all those hats. You know, not all of us look as good in a hat as you do right there. I'm, I'm, I wear a baseball hat, but... I look this good in a hat because the more of my face I hide, the better. The better. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I get it. It's, uh, I, and, and I say, hey, you know, let, let the hair flow, you know, things like that. I, I saw that 10-year picture of you, Doc. You, you look fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was that was that was a real gem right there. I knew I had to I had to show that one off whenever I took it. So yeah. we are now we're at how many years out of the military? You now own eight practices, two orthodontic practices, six general dentist practices. Mm -hmm. So how many years out is this? So so I started. So that was in two thousand ten that, that we started that, and in okay. two thousand nineteen is when we finished selling uh, everything off. So so in so nine years you went nine from years eight practices. Um, That's pretty amazing. So, and you sold that for, um, you know, just a couple hundred thousand dollars, right? A couple hundred thousand. Yeah. So it's, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm doing okay. I'm, I'm doing all right. Um, and, uh, look, it's, um, it's never as much as you want it to be. Okay. I'll right. tell you that right, right now. I mean, everybody who says that they got the number that they wanted when they sold their practice is they're lying. Okay. Um, I would have liked a couple more zeros on the end of it, right. but it, it did allow me to be where I'm at today. And, uh, you know, dentistry is a complete option at this point for me. And I'm, I'm definitely living a, I would say a financially free life and, uh, and I'm very, very happy about it. So, um, you know, well, fortunately, you, I was, you use the word there. I want you to expound on Jim. Mm -hmm. you use the word free. Mm -hmm. Talk to us a little bit about what freedom means in, in, in your evolution as a person yeah. and as a dentist. You know, free, freedom is such a, it, it's such a s strong, powerful word um, that can be used in a great way. It can be a very cliche word, um, but there's nothing else in life that any of us are looking for other than freedom. Um, you know, to me, freedom is about having the choice to do things whether you want to or whether you don't want to, and not because you have to. Um, you you want to position yourself in life to where if I go down path A, I'm going to be okay. If I go down path B, I'm going to be okay. And we get we get into dentistry with all these hopes of, Oh, I'm going to live this great life. It's going to be fantastic. I'm going to have my own practice. I'm going to work until I'm, you know, 70 years old. But there, there's a real problem in our industry. And the, the problem, you know, burnout's a big thing. It is. Um, you know, uh, under, uh, you know, we've got DSOs that uh, want to take over a lot. And, and, and my business was a DSO. There, there was nothing wrong with it. I've, I've seen both ends of the spectrum. Um, I've also seen some great, uh, people do some great stuff with private practice. But what happens to that guy that gets completely burned out? What happens to that guy that maybe their child has, you know, uh, um, you know, some health issues that they have to step out of dentistry? What, what if you break your hand, you know, playing catch with your kid in the backyard or you're getting a car accident, you know? And, and so you, dentistry you don't make money. The traditional model is you make money when you're doing something in somebody's mouth. Okay. And, and unfortunately the way that our industry is actually heading, I mean, we're getting paid from insurance companies and, and you, you know, if you have a fee for service, great on you. I mean, that's fantastic. We were heavily PPO in the practices mm -hmm. that, that, that I owned. Um, but freedom what I did is, is I was, I was literally, I was in practice one time and I'm going to tell a story here about a, a patient and, we, and we've all had this patient. She was late on her bills. Okay. She was, she, she had been into our office. I think I had adjusted her bite probably 15 different times. Yeah. She was complaining about everything. It was, this was going wrong. This staff member treated me. She was late for her appointments. 
And, and I'm a big mountain guy. And my, my office, it, the window at the office was facing the mountains. And it was snowing really hard that day. And here's this woman just on me about all of these things that were wrong. And we, we had done such, we had done the best service for this woman as we possibly could. And, and I know everybody who's listening to this podcast has had that patient. Absolutely. We, we've had that patient that no matter what you do, you just can't make him happy. In fact, I ended up dismissing her because she was so mad that I was talking to my assistant as I was working on her about her birthday. My assistant had just had a birthday and I was asking her about her birthday weekend and she was absolutely just devastated that we weren't only talking about her. And I'm like, you know, so we ended up dismissing her, but I looked out the window back to what I was saying. I, I looked out the window and it was snowing and I'm like, why am I not skiing today? Right. I do not, I do not want to be here with this woman today. Was that kind of a and moment of epiphany for you? It, it was, it, it was one of those things like I did not have the freedom that I set out to do because if I, I, you know, I have bills, I have obligations, I have all these things. I, I can't just get up and, and leave this tomorrow. So I'm going to put myself on a better path to where work is an option and not, a, or, or, or it's an option and not mandatory because then that's right. when it gets really fun. That's when it's like, okay, hey, I can, I can do this because I want to, not because I have to. And, and it's but, always been that you way. You know, Joe, the thing is, and a couple of comments on what you're saying here. The first thing is that most dentists don't own a business. They own a job. Mm -hmm. um, the second yeah, they're, is they're that. They're a legal owner of a business, right? They have a, right. Their, their business is their boss. Yeah. Exactly. And the second thing is, is as a person who owns a job, we give the courtesy of having a written job description to all of the employees in my practice. Mm -hmm but we never give that courtesy to ourselves. And it, that, that courtesy should extend to when is the job done? When are you finished doing this thing, this dentisting thing? And yeah. for me, and you and I have had this conversation before, so actually one of the things that really first struck me about you, one of the things that uh, made, me, made me really like you a lot is that you knew what I meant. In fact, you actually, you, asked, you, you said something about before I brought it up, which was what is your number? And, um, to me, everyone needs to know why they're doing what they're doing. I am doing what I'm doing because I want to give back to dentistry. I want to, I want to do something for a profession that did so much for me. But there's a point at which I say, okay, I am done. And what is that point? For me, $4.5 to $5 million in the bank. Mm -hmm. And um, when you reach that number, you have to give yourself permission to stop working. Yeah. And I think that's a hard thing for a lot of us because we haven't defined it for one. We don't know what our number is. We don't know that it's okay to say that. Yeah. What, what are your thoughts on that? You, this, obviously, this epiphany brought you to this realization, yeah. and this is kind of where everything started and why I wanted you on the show. Yeah. So talk to us a little bit about that. Th this goes beyond just knowing what your number is. I mean, knowing, knowing what your number is is, is a huge Right. The huge thing. Okay. Um, you know, coming to your number, if you have, you know, if you have $5 million in the, in the bank sitting in cash, you know, you're doing $250,000 a year. That's, that's 20 years. Right on the nose. Exactly. Right? Like, 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 like that's 20 years. Okay. Um, and that's a fantastic number. There's nothing wrong with that. Some people may look at that and be like, man, that's way more money than I'm ever going to have. Um, you know, some people may say like, there's no way in hell that 5 million is enough. I want 50 million. Right. Okay. To me, that number and what you want is more about knowing who you are as a person. Exactly. Uh, what, what is it that you want out of life? Is it more time with kids? Is it more time, you know, skiing up in the mountains? Is it better vacations? I mean, we all kind of want the same thing. Like, there's really no magic recipe. It's just, look, do we know who we are? And, and to me, like, dentistry, I always had a, I always struggled when people would say, well, what do you do? And I'm like, okay, am I a dentist? It's like, well, no, I'm not a, a yeah, I'm a dentist by trait, but that's not, that's not what I do. That's not who, who I am. I mean, you know, we, we, we had a tagline in our practice and it was much more than dentistry. And, and our place of work was, I want people to practice being a better version of themselves when they come to work. Okay. It literally is a place where, you learn how to be a better father, a better mother, a more productive 
church member, a more productive member of society, how do we teach individuals within our organization to be better contributors to society? And so you have to, you know, when you look at like what that, you know, coming back to what you talked about what that number is, you have to formulate a path of how do I get to that number so I can have more impact on the things that I want to do so I can get to the, uh, of what I really, really want to do. Because look, I, I love taking vacations. I love skiing. I love spending time with my kids. Look, I don't, I don't enjoy sitting, you know, doing quadrant dentistry, doing MODBL onlays <laughs> and crown preps to the finest margin. Like I, I don't want to be doing that till I'm 70 years old. And but I tell you what, I think it's a much needed profession. And I know there are people who geek out about that. And I love the fact that they do that. And if I can provide a place of employment for those people that love that and look, I mean, here, here's the interesting thing at, at our office, um, you know, here in Utah, then the average dentist in the state of Utah, about $135,000 a year. Our lowest person who was an employee was making over 180 and, 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 and she wasn't that great of a producer. And so we were able to provide a place of employment for somebody that got them to a level that they've never been. They went home, they were more excited for their personal life. They were able to pay down their own bills. I mean, student debt, but it, it comes down to what do you want out of life? And I, and I just never wanted to get to a point where, I mean, I got into business because I wanted that freedom. I didn't, I didn't want that job. And I, you know, people, Oh, I, I'm a business owner. Well, well, are you, are you really a business owner? Because it's, to me, it sounds like you're a slave to your job. Absolutely. I, I couldn't say it better. Now with all that being said, and you said earlier, some a really um, poignant thing to me, you said, there's no recipe. Now the, the truth is, is there is no recipe for personal success. There is no recipe for business success. But if you go and you look at almost any bread in the supermarket, you're going to find that it has milk, it's got flour, it's got eggs. You're going to find a laundry list of things that all of those breads have in common. Unless, of course, you're shopping on the vegan no gluten aisle, in which case you're for, you, feel, you feel free to eat that crap. That's uh, not bread. That's not that, bread. That is what, <laughs> and, and that is what a lot of businesses, dentist-run businesses, practices become. They're trying to cook, you know, the vegan gluten-free, uh, you know, no nuts, you know, what, whatever. It's not really following the recipe or at least not using the ingredients that we know work in the different recipes that all taste good. Yeah. So talk to us a little bit about some of the commonalities of ingredients that are important to running a successful practice, to running a successful business. Sure. It's, it's really simple. Uh, I, and again, I, it's not, people make business so difficult because what they do is they, they, they make it so much about the emotions of dealing with other people. That, that's, that's where we get into trouble, okay? I, there's six things and here's a, here's a little quick, easy thing that people can remember market schedule, treat, collect, refer, repeat. So market schedule, treat, collect, refer, repeat. It's literally that simple. So, you know, if we break those down and, and I did this in, in every one of my offices, cause, cause you can't scale people. That, that's the thing. Our, our business is about people. You can't, <laughs> there's too, there's too many personalities to scale. Absolutely. Okay. But, but you can scale, you know, you can scale certain systems, you can scale certain, uh, you know, programs in your office. And so if you break those down marketing, okay, well, you got to know who your customer is, you know, who I have in, in South Jordan, Utah is going to be different than, you know, in Houston, Texas, there's going to be a different level of income. There's going to be things. But the one thing is, is, you know, let's not kid ourselves. Women make the health decisions. So how do we, how do we market to the women? How do we market to the moms? Okay. And what, and, and depending on the type of practice that you want, I mean, ours was a general dentistry bread and butter practice. We targeted women who were 35 years old to 65 year old with expendable income. You know, when I looked at the demographics around the practices that we bought, it was, you know, who, it wasn't the first time home buyers. It was people who had been established, maybe had some expendable income to spend on, on dentistry. 
because we wanted to, to, to be able to do, you know, to run a profitable business. Absolutely. Well, you know, that makes a lot of sense, but it runs contrary to a lot of advice that's given out there. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not the, the whole build it in, you know, if you build it, they will come. I mean, right. you, you've got to be able to set yourself apart. And, and all this marketing is, is literally telling people what you do. How do you tell people what you do and why you're better than the other person? I mean, I, I, I get a, you know, some grief out here every once in a while because I'll be on TV or we'll be on the radio and things like that. But I literally, they just go on because I, I firmly believe that we had the best dental practice in the area and I wasn't afraid to tell people that. And, and that actually addresses the question I was going to ask as a follow-up, which is, do you find that certain types of media are more effective? I've always felt that video is the most effective media, unless of course you're Richard Nixon, in which case you should stick with radio. Yeah. The, it, right. <laughs> the, uh, absolutely. The, the hands down, the best type of marketing you can do is, is word of mouth. Okay, and I'm, I'm going to say that you, the people that you get in your door, you spend more money on, but then you either run them off or you don't have the guts to even ask for a referral. And so, so <laughs> that reminds me of a, of a live I did once. Whenever I was talking to people, it was like, you want to know how I get Google reviews? You ask. I ask for them. Yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> it's you know, here's the thing, you, you spend the money on marketing and, and here's the other thing too, let, let's, let's back it up to marketing. You spend the money on marketing, whether there's TV or radio or print or, you know, maybe you've got a, a sign twirler out on the side. I don't know, but those that also do is they get your phones to ring. Right. So there's got to be a proper way of scheduling that appointment when they get the phone. Because one thing that drives me nuts in practices is it's not an information source. You're not an encyclopedia. That patient calls. Your goal is you're selling an appointment time. That's yep. it. Because you, you can't, it, I don't care how noble and great you think you are. If you can't get them in the door, all of your great services, all of those CE courses that you went to, if they're not in your chair to do it, you can't, you can't serve anybody. Okay? So you get them in your door. You do great service. Why not? I mean, if you feel good about what you did, why do you have any problems asking for a referral? I absolutely agree. You know, and so we, we, we're humble. We, we want to be, you know, have this sense of humility about us. So not only could the doc be asking for it, but why can't the assistants be asking for the referral? Why couldn't you put that in place? And, and so referral is, is definitely an underutilized source. Um, I feel that, you know, social media is a, is a great avenue. Mm -hmm. um, radio and TV is a little bit more expensive, but, but it definitely depends on, on this, I, I would say. Are you trying to be a big fish in a small pond or are you trying to be a small fish in a big pond? Right. You know, who, who, do, you, who do you feel comfortable being? And literally, I mean, if you can get out and just tell people what you do, they're, they're not going to, you might get looked down upon from your peers and stuff like that, but my God, have a little bit more of a backbone to not care about that because you're there to serve the community. And I, I love it. So one of the things I will say um, in marketing, many of us concentrate more upon the modality rather than on the close. And, mm -hmm. and what I mean by that is there are many different modalities that will get your phone ringing. Sure. If no one's answering your damned phone, mm -hmm. all of the money you've just spent on marketing, and that, that was God one of the God. things I was going to caution with TV. TV works, mm -hmm. but you have to have a call bank. If you don't have a call bank mm -hmm. or several people answering the phones, you are losing money hand over fist. Yeah. And it was uh, when I was at three practices, I actually uh, I, I thought about it at two, but we actually started a call center in Good. our practice. I thought and you might have. I was going to ask. Yeah. And, and a call center that we have, I mean, we're, we were talking one person, mm -hmm. two, two people, you know, and, uh, you know, we ended up getting up to five or six people in the call center because that's what the, the volume required. Right. But you don't have to start at those things. I mean, it could be a cell phone that somebody carries around with them that, uh, you know, that they're able to there, but it's, it's, you know, this traditional, Hey, we're only open from nine to five Monday through Thursday. Man, uh, we literally, all we did is we answered our phones more than anybody, you know, Monday, right. through, Monday through Friday, seven to seven. And even if you're not open, there should be someone answering the phones. Oh yeah. You have to, 
you have to have to have to have that uh, you know, modality of answering those phones because if you don't, then like you said, you're wasting your marketing dollars. Well, in our, in our current, the way our society works right now, we are very um, gratification driven. We're very results driven. We want it now. And so if you call somewhere and they can be the best dentist in the community and you know it and you get no answer and you call somewhere else and somewhere else and finally you end up with the worst, crappiest dentist in the entire community yeah. Yeah. when they say, here's an appointment time, you take it and you check that off of your little to-do list. Mm -hmm. I made the appointment. It didn't, the, the to-do didn't say make the appointment with, with the best person to do the job. The to-do said make the appointment. Yeah. And once you've done that, you, you're satisfied to get this endorphin release and everybody's happy until, you know, they have to deal with the crap work or what have you, what, you know, whatever, why ever we're saying they're the worst dentist. Sure. But the point is, is that's how consumers are driven. Without understanding that, we can't possibly serve them up what they want. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, and that's, that's the thing. Like we we're so scared and, and that's all, if you're not getting your word out, if you're not getting um, your message out or asking for the referral or the Google review, it comes down to more about your insecurities right. than it does about which if you're going to really serve somebody, get over yourself. Because it, I, I had so many guys that were so talented and so good that didn't do as much dentistry. They didn't help as many people as they possibly could have. Um, and it did. I, I worked for a guy that was that dentist that, that didn't do the best dentistry. But his doors were always filled. The community loves him. He, he, he was, you know, and, and he, does, he does an okay job. Right. But he was, he was available to his patients. He talked to his patients. He was confident in what he was doing and he was able to do those services. And so I, I think honestly, I mean, people that don't take the time to really understand who they are and the value that they bring, they've got to look at doing some serious soul searching because they're not, you know, they may do good dentistry on three or four people, but man, what if they could do it on three or 400 people? Absolutely. That, that, that's, that's what the impact's about. No. Now, Joe, I always like to leave people with some meat and potatoes from each subject that we're going to cover. So before sure. we move on beyond marketing, I'm going to share my patient script, if you will. It's not really a script. It's kind of just about kind of what I say okay. and what my people say, and I'd like you to do the same. Okay. So we've just finished treating somebody. Miss Jones, did you have fun today? We had a blast seeing you. Um, I, I'm a little bit, a bit embarrassed to ask, but would you recommend us to someone? Do you know anyone who needs a good dentist? And they always say yes. Yeah. So what, let, let me, okay. Let me ask so you this. Me your, oh, go ahead. Okay. So I, I love what you said there. Okay. So here, here's, here's the thing. So, you know, Hey, Mrs. Jones, I would love to have a thousand patients just like you. I had a Absolutely. lot of fun today. Thank you so much for coming in. It's always great to see you. So, Hey, we're always looking for great patients like you. Do you have any friends or family members that are looking for a dentist? Because you know, we take great care of you and we'd love to ha have them over here. Absolutely. And so those, when, those two things say, yes, have a lot in common. Yeah. Oh, okay, go ahead. I was, I was going to say, here, here's the key point though. This is what you've got to do because this is where we fall short. When they say yes, you've got to follow up with this. Great. What's their name? So right. when they come in, we can make sure that we take care of them and we can let them know um, that, you know, we always appreciate having you in. Subconsciously, what that patient does when they say that name and see you're, you're reading my mind right now, mm -hmm. when they say that name, all of a sudden, when they say, you know, Jim at the gym, you know, Jim at the gym or Jim at the grocery store. Right. Oh, Hey Jim, you know, yeah, I got, I remember, you know, I saw doc Hoffbauer. He was amazing. You got to go see my guy. Okay. That's the psychological trigger that people think. Absolutely. And that, that we're missing. And so you've just capitalized on their need to be consistent and truthful. Yes. And, th and, that, and that comes down to, you know, Cialdini's power of influence right there, right? You've got that book over there. It's right here somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> so, but that's the thing. You, you, people want to be cons consistent. And so, you know, if they come back in, it's like, oh, you know, did you refer anybody? Oh, I, I, I forgot to send them over. That's the thing. People, people want to send you referrals. I mean, you know, we probably have 95% of our patients that we do good by or more, maybe even 98%. Yeah. We only remember that one patient that destroyed our day. Oh, absolutely. We, we always remember the negative. But, you know, an, an, an interesting point here, uh, kind of in the same line of 
inexpensive ways to advertise, inexpensive ways to market. I worked for someone whose practice wasn't growing, and I made a simple suggestion whenever they brought me on. Uh, this was during my first year before I started my, my scratch startup. I said, why don't we just put up a sign that says, now taking new patients? Pretty simple. And the, the funny thing is, is that he would never do that. When I had my own practice and things slowed down, I'd put out a sign or I'd put out on social media, now accepting new patients. And all of a sudden, the phones are great. It's crazy. Yeah. I don't know why people think you're not taking new patients. But. Well, you know, sometimes it's just, it's just that acknowledgement. You drive down a road. I, I would say the same with signage. Right. You know, like sign, signage is a big key because, you know, these guys that have these little hidden offices, put the biggest, damn, brightest sign that the city will allow you to do in front of your Absolutely. building. Absolutely. And uh, it, yeah, I mean, get, just, just tell people you're there and, you know, they'll, they'll come, you know. All right. We've gone through market. What is our next step? Uh, so market schedule. So, so schedule. So there's a specific way, you know, that phone rings. There's a, there's a way of scheduling patients. Um, and again, you know, you've got a, there, there's a whole psychology and I, I learned this from a great mentor, uh, you know, a, of mine that kind of helped with this. You're selling that appointment time. You want to schedule them accordingly. And so, you know, are they a new patient? Are they, you know, scheduling some of their treatment right there? And there's got to be a protocol, you know, for that. And so, I'm a big believer in get them while they're hot. So you, if, if you don't make yourself available, you know, within that day or the next day, they're going somewhere else. Right. And, and so, you know, uh, you should be able to get emergencies in right away, fit them in somehow, Absolutely. even if you get them out of pain. I, I was actually going to bring that up if you didn't. I always keep three or four slots, just 30 minute slots open during my day where I can do an emergency exam. And I, I like to keep one right before lunch because sometimes I'll decide to work through lunch to do that crown, yeah. you know? Yeah, I, and I hope you buy your assistant lunch or- Absolutely. Or take care of the team and let them know- Absolutely. How valuable they are, right? They would I, kill me otherwise. What are you talking about? Yeah, I, I, had a, I had a doc that would always run through lunch and he would just burn through assistants. And I'm like, and he's like, well, they're my assistants are leaving me. And I'm like, well, it's because you treat them like they're peasants, you know? Oh, no, absolutely. Like, yeah, take good care of them. I, I actually, I'll get mine just because gifts sometimes. I'll just bring them a card. And it, it's so dumb, but this works so much whenever it comes to building a, a team culture. I'll just bring them a card and it says, hey, do you remember last week whenever you did such and such? I just want to say thank you. Mm -hmm. right. Just that one little handwritten note. Yeah is it's phenomenal how well it works. Yeah, it, it really is. I think the, uh, the handwritten note is, and it's, it's a part, it's a part piece of art that has been lost. I believe you know, it, it's everybody wants to text. Everybody wants to email. We want the quick, the now man there there's, when I get a handwritten note, you know, a little, little thank you. Man, it's, it's cool. You want to hang it up on your fridge. You want to like show people and they it, stick it in their purse or what have you that text, whenever they read it, it's gone. Well, yeah. when it's in their purse or whatever, they pull it out and they see it and they have that little flash of gratitude or that yeah. little flash of empathy every time they see it. Yeah. I, yeah. I think it's an amazing thing to do, but yeah. No, it's, I, I think it's incredible and, it, and it's just a great part of that referral reward program that you should have Absolutely. in place. You know, so, um, you know, coming, coming back to the schedule that you had asked about, um, you know, you want people in the door. Right. And so you've got to be, they've got to be available or you've got to make yourself available or a team member available. You've got to get them now, like I was saying, but you also have to be respectful of that patient's time. I, I see people schedule so much that often people are waiting in the waiting room, 20, 30, 40. Absolutely. Minutes. It's just people, people don't want to do that. Yeah. That's just, they're going to go to the guy down the street and, and look, I, I've been guilty of that. But I tell you what we do when we are guilty of that, we are talking to that patient all the time. We are going out there, hey, you know, sorry, we're running a little bit behind. Can we do this? And every time that we ever had somebody that we ran longer than 15 minutes or something for, you know, give them a $10 gift card to Target or, you know, a restaurant or some, just something just to set yourself apart. Because um, we, look, we're not perfect, but, you know, you, you do your damn best to try to be, so... Absolutely. We, we have a rule in our practice that if someone is waiting for 10 minutes, they need to be moved. So you move them to the consult. People have about a 15 minute 
temper switch where yeah. if they've waited for 15 minutes, then they explode. You move them before the 15 minutes and you just apologize and say, I am so sorry that you're having to wait. We generally don't run behind time. We had an emergency. Thank you so much for being so understanding. May I get you some coffee or some water? Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Well, and that's the thing. We, it's easy. You, you schedule them. And then when they come into your office, let, you know, you, you've, let's say you're, you, you pass that magical threshold of scheduling them. Right. When you do get onto the treating part, it's not drilling and cleaning the teeth. It's how do you treat that human being when they walk That's into your door. That's attached to the teeth. Exactly. Patients know about a couple of things. They know about the chair they sit their ass in in the waiting room, mm -hmm. and they know about the chair that they sit their ass in in the treatment room and how they were treated in between those two places. Yeah. Well, and people, people buy on emotions, right? You know, they don't, they, we don't buy on logic. Yeah. And, and so if we, what's the saying, you know, you, you don't always remember what, you know, what they did or something, but you always remember, you know, hundred percent of the time of how you felt. Right. And if people feel like they're being taken care of, you know, I, I mean, I'd, I'd ask your, you know, you doc, I mean, how many times does somebody come into your house where you don't, you know, a brand new person, do you, do you show them around your house? Do you give them a drink of water? Do you give them a little whiskey? <laughs> the, first, the first thing I say is, I really have to apologize. We have two kids. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go into that bathroom. Right, I, exactly. I think, I think most parents can empathize with that. But okay. yeah, exactly. Whenever you have somebody who comes into your house, you treat them with hospitality. And if that hospitality doesn't extend to your office, then it's not a place they're going to feel comfortable. I 100% yeah. agree. Well, and they, and they won't buy from you. I don't care right. how, how big, you know, how good you can explain that clinical, you know, margin that you need to do for that crown. If they don't like you, they're not going to buy. And, and that gets around to the point of sales. And folks, you've heard me say this before. If you cringe when you hear the word sell, you are in the wrong business in any business. Uh, you should go into philanthropy and give away everything that you have because everything in the world is selling, including every time you shake someone's hand, Yep. And if you can't sell the amazing work that you can do, well, then you are worthless. Yeah, <laughs> I, it's, it's true. I mean, I, I'm glad you said it, but honestly, look, sales is one of those things that it is every aspect of life. Well, look, if you can't sell to someone the thing that they need. Well, here, you're a married guy. You yeah. Had to, you, had, you had to sell your wife on marrying you. You know, I'm sure it wasn't a hard sell. Was the, that was the hardest sell I ever had. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, but, but I mean, my point is, is like every interaction, every patient, every relationship that we have with another human being is a sell. Absolutely. You, you know, but what, what you need to do in a sell is, and, and this is where you can easily close, it's not what you can do for me. It's what value can I provide to you? Right. You know, how, how can I serve you? And there's, there's steps along that sales process that, you know, and we, we always implemented those in our offices because it is, it, it's, it's, it's more. And we're going to get to that, but I have to drag you back to where I dragged you okay. away from. That's which okay. is Give us some meat and potatoes about the scheduling. The scheduling. Okay. So, so the scheduling, um, and this was something that I learned from a mentor of mine. So calling on the phone, they're scheduling or the patient um, that they're leaving people never want to feel boxed into something. Okay. So there's kind of five steps that you can look at when scheduling somebody. Okay. Uh, and really what it comes down to is you want to steer the conversation for somebody to it. Okay. You answer the phone some way and it's, you know, Hey, you know, say, uh, you know, apex dental, you know, this is Bob. How may I help you? Okay. Oh, you know, how much does your crown cost? Okay. It, people want to know those kind of things. They want to do it, you know, stuff like that. You want to give people options so they're not being boxed in. And one of these things that I've learned along the way is called the dual alternative close. Okay. okay. And so you want to get them away from what they're thinking. And so, okay, hey, Bob, everybody's different, um, you know, and, and crowns, we're not really entirely sure if you need that crown or so. So what we like to do is we'd like to get you into our office um, to evaluate whether it is you need a crown or if there's some other type of treatment that we can do for you. And then instead of the, letting them talk from there, it's literally, would you prefer today or tomorrow? Would you prefer next week or, you know, this week? So you start big and you work your way down. 
Okay. And, and again, this is something that, that I learned from my mentors and it was, uh, and I'll tell you right now, it was at the scheduling Institute, mm-hmm. uh, with Jay Geyer and it, we were there, uh, clients of his for a little while. And, um, we learned this, that was, it, it was pretty fantastic. And it, it increased our new patient numbers dramatically. So if you say, okay, Hey, this week or, you know, or next week. And so let's say that they say, Oh, I want to get in this week. Okay. Would you prefer Wednesday or Thursday? And then they say, mm-hmm. okay, I'd like Wednesday. All right. Would you, would you prefer morning or afternoon? Uh, afternoon. Okay. We've got one o'clock or three o'clock available. And so subconsciously it gets those people away from that. Okay. I want to do it. You know, like how much does this crown cost? Because right. they're, they, they need to get in <coughs> someone because if you've given the answer, Oh, our crowns cost 900 bucks. You've lost them. Right. You've lost them. And, and I would like to say that is, the most tragic thing ever because a person who calls you who says how much does your crown cost is in a buying state of mind yeah they want to buy a crown those are huge buying signals huge buying signals and so that again, and another one people who argue over price yeah yeah oh that that just sounds like those are the people who are ready to buy that's the only reason they're objecting mm-hmm. is because they're ready to buy they if you're able to ex- articulate the value that you're going to be delivering, you, people will part with their money. They, people, people will part with their money. And so, you know, when you schedule, you do something as simple as that dual alternative. You, see, I'm, I, I know I'm stirring something in your mind because you're like, yeah, like that's, it's, this is why you and I talk for three or four hours. Exactly, exactly. Because it's the same, but yeah. So, I mean, something as simple as that, you know, with, with scheduling. And then from there, it's you just get them scheduled, Kate, and then you get them on the books. It's 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 nothing that's that more you know more difficult than that. But there has to be like these little steps. And you know what I'll do, Doc, too, if you'd like me to, um, on your uh, you know the business of dentistry. Yeah, I'll, I'll post something for you that's just literally the written steps. Absolutely. That, that has like these things that we followed with it. That's really really easy to follow. Now, I think that would be an amazing generous gift. Yeah, no, I'm ha- happy to do it. So. All right. So we've gone through marketing and we've gone through scheduling. Mm-hmm. You've gotten the patient interested. They've called your practice. You've gotten their butt in a seat. Mm-hmm. What's the next step? So, so hopefully you put, before you put their butt in the seat, you've, uh, you, you took them around the office. You get the, the, the liking sides of things, right? And, you know, I, we were a PPO office, so we did have uh, quite a few patients. It was uh, a high volume uh, practice. Um, there's got to be, you know, number one, you got to find out why that patient's there. So we used a quick thing. It was called the four minute rule. You know, it was literally family, occupation, recreation, and everything else. You know, okay. find out, find out about this patient, find out who they are as a human being, get them to like you. Um, and so you, there's this interview of that and then also finding out why they're there. Learn how to make people shut up without being rude. Super important. <laughs> I know, and, and you know what? You do a great job because I tend to run on sometimes. And, and, oh, ask you why. We're, we're, we're a peas in a pod here. <laughs> but yeah, so the assistant's doing that. And then why are they there? But then in addition to that, you've got to find out what that patient values. Is it cosmetic? Is it function? Is it, is it you know what? I want to do the, this at the least possible amount of money possible. You know, mm. I want, you know, yeah, my tooth is black up front, but I want to fix this guy over here. Right. You know, and so that's actually a combination of um, Cialdini method and um, Paul homily, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, 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 it's literally, I mean, you know, treat people right. Like, like their friends, first of all, and then find right. out why they're there. So then as the doctor comes in, they've got to get passed off from the, um, you know, the patient or, or excuse me, from the assistant or, you know, hygienist or whoever it is. Hey, you know, doc, this is Mrs. Jones. She's in here. She's, you know, she's leaving her business of, you know, five years down the street here. Um, you know, she's got this toothache that's happening up here and she wants to see if we can do it as cheap as possible. Okay. So that, that passive, um, did this just freeze on us here a little bit? I think we're okay. Aren't we? Okay. No, we're good. Okay. Um, but people don't want to tell their story all over again. If I come in there and it's like, Oh, Hey, you know, tell me your name. Tell me what you do. Thank you. Write me. it down. It's like, it's, and so, you know, if you have somebody introduce that to you, all of a sudden this patient's feeling heard. 
they like this assistant and mm -hmm. you know our job as doctors is not to screw up what our assistants just did for us right you know because all of a sudden we're hearing that this is, tooth is needing some stuff okay we address that first we talked about that and then we mentioned some of the other things say hey you know are these things that you're aware of because maybe they didn't maybe they weren't aware of it right and so you know so you go through that process from there you know you do your diagnosis you you know you have your small talk you go back and forth and then uh, you know then you bring in the next person okay when you bring in the next person that's your financial person okay right. it's so imperative for a doctor and this goes back to the sales process okay and and if your listeners remember anything they've got to remember this part if you want to make your financial person's job easy you close the patient first so the way that you get the patient to close is number one is, okay hey you know doc I explained to you you know how we you know this cavity that you have up here on the top right I showed you the picture of it you understand that we need a crown like is there any other questions that you have about it okay they do that okay perfect so if we're able to work out the finances for you and everything there does it sound okay we're gonna go ahead and do the crown for you here today yeah, you know, Doc, I'd lo love to go ahead and do that crown. The finance person comes in. Hey, same kind of pass off. This is, you know, Mary. She's done this and stuff. I talked to her about doing a crown up on number three. She's agreed to the treatment and she wants to get started on it ahead of time. When that person hears that they agreed to the treatment, mm -hmm. then it's like, okay, I've got to do the treatment. Now we just got to find a way to get consistency again. It's all about the consistency. Do you ballpark? Um, I've, I've heard lots of different schools of thought. I've done both ways myself. Uh, on the phone or in the, uh, in the office? No, no, in the office. Um, on the phone, if I'm in a ballpark, I'm going to do a low high game. Yeah. Oh, it could be as little as such and such or as much as such and such. Do it all the time. You'll have to, yeah. So yeah. in the chair, the only time I ever ballpark is something that's going to be over $20,000. I'll mm -hmm. always ballpark and say, I think you got about this much work to do. They're going to figure all that out and what your insurance will and will not cover. Honestly, if I told you what I thought I'd cover, I'd be a big fat liar. They're really good at this. Yeah. So I'm going to get them in here to talk to you about that. But if we can find a way to make this fit within your monthly budget, mm -hmm. do you think we can go ahead and get started on that today? Is yeah. that fair? And I always use an, is that fair? Can we do that? Yeah. It's, it's like a mantra around my office. The girls will roll their eyes at me when I say, is that fair? Yeah. But. I, I mean, there's, there's nothing wrong with it. I think it's great. And the other thing you did there was hugely, uh, you know, uh, valuable was you gave a sense of credibility to your financial. Absolutely. Person. Because yeah, yeah. she's my financial goddess, man. She's amazing. You froze this time. Yeah. And, and, and if anybody is, oh, there we go. Is, uh, are we okay there? We're okay again. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. She, she's your expert and she's the one that's going to help them with that problem because if you've done everything Absolutely. in your job of explaining the value, they want to pay for it. And even if it is a 20,000, $30,000, case, you know, right. but you know, ballparking, there's, there's nothing wrong with it. I, I would quote on the low end and, and the high end. They're only going to remember the low end, you know, I'll tell mm -hmm. you that right now. But at the same time, you know, you, you can only do your best to give them that range and say, okay, you know what, we're going to get that in here. And before we do any treatment, we're going to get you the exact amount. And you right. honor that, you honor that amount. Is, Absolutely. Even, even, if, even if you screw up, you've got to do it. You've got Absolutely. To do it. Totally on the same page. It, it's worth, if you screwed up by $2,000, there's nothing that you can buy marketing wise that's worth $2,000 the way that that $2,000 is worth in that patient's mouth when they go out and they tell their friends, he screwed up on the, co on the quote, but he honored what he told me. He's honest. Yep. Yeah. They, uh, it's, you know, and on social media, they'll go on, oh, they screwed up my price here. Like we had people in our office that, that did that. You know, they would um, mess up on some of the uh, uh, different right. things. And it, it, was, it was important for them to, uh, to, to honor that because, you know, the, the value of a patient, depending on where you're at in the country, I mean, it values from anywhere from 1500 bucks to 2500 bucks. You know, if you're doing higher end dentistry, it could be up to four or 5000 They go and tell 11 of their friends I mean, you're, you're losing $20,000 all because you want to be right. You know, Absolutely. Well, we, I think we've had this discussion. It's too important to many dentists to be right. Yeah. Um, oh, that's, uh, that's almost a podcast in and of itself. Oh, geez. We could, we could talk for hours on that. You know, you don't, 
there, there's so many different ways to do it, but at the bottom line is, is are you doing the best job and the best service for that patient? Right. You know, can, can you and, take a, can you take care of them how you're supposed to? And, and you know, something I tell my patients in, in this vein is um, I will always quote you higher than I think it's going to be because people like surprises for the most part. Oh yeah. Yeah. You're giving them money but, back at that point. Exactly. And, but the thing is, is if I, if I tell you it's going to be $2,000 and it's $3,000, that's an unpleasant surprise yeah. and you're going to be mad at me. But if I tell you it's $3,000 and it's $2,000 mm-hmm. or if it ends up being $3,000, you're either going to say, wow, that was great. Or man, he knows yeah. his stuff. Yeah. And I'll just tell them just like that. And, and then they have a reasonable expectation of what I'm, t- what I'm saying. And they have the hope that it's a little bit less. And when it turns out to be a little bit less, man, they are over the moon. Yeah. They're over, yeah. There's, there's nothing wrong with quoting on the high end for sure. And, and I'm a firm believer in that because you really don't know. Yeah. Right. That, that surprise when they get that at the end, like you never told oh, them. Goodness. Well, the surprise whenever you open up that PFM that had the open margin and instead of having good solid tooth structure underneath, you've got soup and now you've got yeah, to yeah. do a post and core to build the tooth up so you can put a crown on it oh, and you didn't tell the patient. Yeah, it's good. That's, well, that's a bad, bad place to be. E- easiest way to, to do that too. I mean, if it's to, you know, to fix that. I mean, if you have intraoral cameras in your office, that's one of the yeah. easiest ways. Absolutely. If you, if, you, if you don't have intraoral cameras in your office, I mean, there's some of the cheapest intro. You can get them for 50 bucks, you know, and, uh, I have a DSLR in every op. You have to. You have Absolutely. To. Mm-hmm. All right. So now we've gotten our patient in the chair and we've gotten them treatment plan. So where, where are we going next? Yeah. So, I mean, you, you do so the market you, schedule treat. treat. Yeah. So you, you treat them, you, you do it, but at the same time, and then the next thing is collect. So I, I would always like to encourage collecting ahead of time. I was going to say, I would, pref- I would prefer to put collect before treat, but you yeah, can't exactly. always do that. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, sometimes, I mean, people they want it, you know, whatever, but I'm, I'm a firm believer in you do not do a service unless somebody can pay for it. I mean, it's, right. you know, do you value yourself? Do you value the service that you're providing? And, you know, we all, we all want to be, you know, good servants. We all want to like help people. But at the same time, you have to have the mindset that if you don't have strong financial arrangements in place before you do the treatment, you're not going to be able to serve anybody. You're not going to be able to give your staff bonuses. You're not going to be able to market to other people or help the community. And so, you know, here's your copay. This is what it's going to cost. Um, You know, this, this is your portion. How are you, you know, we have a variety of different options. Is it care credit? Is it a local credit union? You know, how do we get all of these people that we're treating to be able to pay? Or, you know, maybe you have an in-house financing that you do. I don't, I don't know. Right. I personally don't like that. I'm, I'm in the business of dentistry. I wasn't a bank. Right. You know, and, and so that's what I think is funny is when people try to become bankers when they can't even run their own house. <laughs> so I have a rule, okay? Um, if I'm going to do in-house financing, it's going to be in-house financing on extractions with bone graft and PRF. One of my highest profit items is extraction bone graft PRF. You're looking at six to seven hundred dollars for a material cost of seventy dollars plus yeah. labor, and I will in-house finance that for twenty percent down every day of the week. That's yeah, and but that's else. about the only thing I'll in-house finance. And and it, and it varies from practice to practice. You know, right. you want you want to be able to. Um, I mean, it's it's whatever your model is, you know. But you have to have a strong collections in place and you have to get paid for what and you have to know what stuff costs yes which is something you and i were talking about before if you don't know your cog your cost of goods sold Mm -hmm. you you are not a business owner yeah yeah you're you're business owned (laughs) you're a slave (laughs) well and we do and here's the funny thing because i knew what my cogs were and i knew what it was look i didn't mind taking some of the ppos Right. You know, I mean, I know there's a huge push out there to be a fee for service and those things. I mean, there's some guys that they're in the business of dentistry there. They'll have, you know, their crowns be $300 and some guys that I'm not going to do it for anything less than 1100. Right. Okay. I mean, we had some insurances that would, you know, be $480 for the crown. Now, you know, a lot of those times there was a lab fee that you could attach to the top of it. There was um, you know, a buildup that you, the, the, the tooth may or may not need. You never want to over treat, but you also want to maximize what the, those insurance allows you to charge, you know, and it's, and it's literally just whatever you do, you charge for it. 
you know, don't, don't make it any more complicated than that. I, I agree. There, there's a lot of people out there and they, honestly, I've, I've, I've gotten a bit of crap about um, every time I plan a crown, I plan a build up every single yeah. time. Nothing wrong and with that. You don't know what you're getting into. Until you absolutely. Do it. And I'll, I'll say seven out of 10 times I'm doing the buildup uh, because I like have to have absolutely picture perfect textbook, yeah. you know, three to four millimeters of feral, beautiful crown. Mm -hmm. But there are sometimes I'll squirt a little bit on an undercut and not charge for it. Yeah. It just honestly, it depends on what you need to get through it. Yeah. Yeah, your, your, your work has to speak for itself. You still got to do good quality dentistry because it, it'll catch up to you. I mean, it definitely will catch up to you. If you're not, if you're not uh, providing longevity for that patient, though, you know, they're going to they're gonna know after a while. You know, it may take a couple of years, but right. at the end of the day, well, can you and, and, and a couple of years are going to tell everyone. There's an old rule in retail, and that is that a happy, satisfied customer will tell one person and a dissatisfied customer will tell 10 people. There are actually studies done to show this. Mm -hmm. In the digital age, those numbers are logarithmically increased. Oh, for sure. One, one happy person can tell thousands, but an unhappy person will tell tens of thousands. Yeah, it's so, it's so true, you know, and, and that's the, uh, uh, you've got to be able to just provide a good service and help people, but, you know, get compensated for it. So, <laughs> so, so you're, that on, is you're on collect. To collect, you must know how to charge insurances if you are in network with a PPO. Yep. Let's talk a little bit about that and some of the different things coding-wise that they may be missing out on. And some of the different things, um, for instance, always making sure you got a bite wing, a PA, and a picture of any tooth that needs to be crowned. Mm -hmm. in, in, my, in my experience, if you do that, you're never not going to get paid yep. unless a lot it's of obviously wasn't paid. A lot of insurances require the x-ray upon seat. Yeah. And you're, you can't charge the patient for it. It's just the, if you're going to play in the PPO game, you got to play in the PPO rules, you know? So that's a, that's a part it, of it. But. Dr. Dr. Travis Campbell is big, is big on saying that, uh, is it basically, it's just all a game. You just have to know the the rules of the game mm -hmm. and then abide by the rules. Then you win. Yeah. It's not, I mean, that's, that's literally what business comes down to. Are you willing to play the game that you're choosing to be in? And if Absolutely. you want, to, if you want a fee for service practice, then make it work. <laughs> PPO practice, then you got to make that work. Well, you know, because we actually, we're, we're quote, out of network. I have a big, you know, a chip on my shoulder about the difference between fee for service and out of network. I'm an OON provider. Okay. So we actually still provide the service of filing for our patients and we want to make sure that they get paid. Granted, we get paid whether or not they get paid by the insurance, but it's, it's a service that we do because we feel that it's important because it's difficult for them to do on their own and, and, and make sure. it. And so, Every single scaling root planning, we're, we have a full perio chart. A lot of doctors only do probing depths. Yeah. You can't get paid on that. Not anymore. You, you've no, got to do a full probing chart. You can't. Yeah, yeah. You Full probing chart, full mouth x-rays. You got to do I mean, there's, there's, I mean, we could go procedure by procedure about what the requirements are. And, you know, I mean, I had. It would take all day long, Joe. Oh, Just tell yeah. them to hire somebody who's well-trained. Well, here's the thing. I had. 28 <coughs> insurances that we took 28 different insurances and each of those insurances had five to 10 different plans. I had people that were in charge of that. I yeah. wasn't going to figure that out and yeah. they were awesome at it. They, 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 that was their so job. If you guys are interested, um, there is a free tool called the PK index that PK performance solutions has now. Um, I helped them to invent it. It tests clinical knowledge, insurance knowledge, and logical reasoning ability. I would suggest that before you ever hire anyone, you have them take that test. They must score over a 65 to be a good insurance coordinator. So, I love it. I love it. I think that, I think that's good. We, we all, I never expected them to pick up a handpiece, you know, and I, I don't expect to be able to figure out all those insurances. Where, where are those different hats? I'm going to send you, I'm going to send you a link to the, uh, to the PK performance test. I'd love to see what you do. I know you're going to blow the reasoning and logic off the, off the charts. I, I'd, love, I'd love to take it. I hope I don't disappoint. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no one scored 100 yet. It's pretty funny. Okay. So anyway, uh, now that we have collected, mm -hmm. we repeat. It's, well, so refer, repeat. 
Refer. Yeah, so, so refer. So it's, 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 uh, and well, I kind of, I kind of got you out of order there earlier. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, no, you, yeah, you talked about that a little bit earlier and just like having that strong referral program. Um, and here, here's an interesting thing that you can do too. So, and I'm, I'm going to tell you about one of the things that I learned that we actually got in trouble for. Okay. Okay. Um, and referrals, what we <laughs> do, um, is we used to reward our patients. We would give them apex bucks. We'd give them a $25 credit for every patient that they send in to us. Okay. Some dentists across the country complained because they said that it was essentially, you know, you, you can't do that. It's illegal. Right. You know, I, I've, I've heard those kind of things. And paid, paid referrals um, runs afoul of the stark law in some cases. Yeah. And so, so we were contacted by the Department of Commerce uh, here in Utah said, hey, you can't do it. It was basically just like a little slap on the hand said, don't do it. Mm -hmm. But then I asked them if we could do this. Can we thank our patients in other ways for sending us referrals? And they said, sure. So this is what we came up with. Anybody who sent us a referral, yeah. we sent them a thank you card and a gift the next day mm -hmm. for being amazing patients. Absolutely. So, hey, Bob, thank you for being such an incredible patient. Here's a gift courtesy of Apex Dental. Oh and, by, oh, and by the way, we, Thank saw, you for that. <laughs> we saw Jim yesterday. He was a great patient. That's not illegal. Right. First no name problem. only or first initial last name, but first name only usually works. Thank them on the day after. Don't reward them right then. And just tell them that they're, you're giving them the gift for being an amazing patient, not right. for the referral. It just so happens Absolutely. It comes with the referral. So it's just a simple... Simple game. And it's, it's, it's honestly, a lot of it is just silliness. Those, those laws and this whole Sunshine Act were created to stop big business from bribing doctors to prescribe medications and things like that. And it just yep. so happens we fall under the umbrella. Yep. So I imagine they were, they were pretty understanding, but, you know, had to tell you to quit. Yeah, that was just, and then it was just fine, whatever. But this, this is the way I look at it. You know, if, if somebody's kicking you in the ass, it's just because you're out front. You know, That's and true. Uh, it's, uh, you know, they're, they're, that one doctor, I mean, if he would worry more about how he could improve his business and how he <laughs> could take care of his <laughs> He wouldn't have had time to complain. Yeah. And so whatever we will. We'll, and, and honestly, I wasn't even aware that we couldn't do that. And so once I was made aware of it, we changed our process, but we played the game. Absolutely. So, well, and then you do the process all over. That's absolutely. It. And, and including creating new offices. Yeah. You can the same way. Different. So once, once you had all of your, your SOPs in order, um, how long did it take you to be, begin to scale practices faster whenever you would purchase practices or do de novos? You know, I, I know, or at least I feel, because I have only had my one practice. Mm -hmm. I feel as if, if I could just take all the knowledge I've gained in the seven years I've been practicing and say, you know, I don't have to reinvent any of that shit. Yep. I've got this rule book. I can just take it over here and make a cookie cutter. Mm -hmm. I feel as if that's a super powerful thing. Is it as powerful as I'm imagining having the SOPs standardized across the practices? It's, it, it is only to the point of how much your managers or you're willing to hold somebody accountable to those. Implement, things. implement, implement. Yeah. Yeah. And because that's the thing, I mean, I can write down anything in the world and me do it. And then I write it down for somebody else and they do it in an entirely different way. But, but what do you mean I have to address you as my Lord and Savior? Yeah. Just do it. It's in the rule book. It's in the rule. But that's the thing. You know, the rule book is only there as a recipe. I mean, if you don't follow the recipe and you don't follow the guidelines and then follow up with people, because like we're, we're human beings, we make mistakes. We don't, you know, we've been cooking for a long time. We don't have to follow a recipe, right? Right. But if we have somebody to help hold us accountable, Okay. It's like, uh, you know, if, if you work out, okay, I know I personally work out a lot better if I have somebody who's like sitting there watching me do the reps, telling me what I'm supposed to do. I, mm -hmm. I mean, I know what I'm supposed to do. doesn't mean I want to do it or I'm going to constantly right. do it, but it's, it, it comes down to so much of human psychology. Yes, SOPs are fantastic, but it's so imperative that you have somebody to help understand that person of delivering that service. You know, why didn't this, this person follow this SOP? Well, maybe they had a, a shitty day because their, 
you know, wife just left him or something. I don't know. Right. You know. But. So did you have a trainer of trainers or did you have a trainer who you designated as the person who went to every new practice? I know a lot of people who have group practices will have like a dream team yeah. and they'll go in and those are the people who train everyone and onboard them. Yeah. And that's basically their whole job. So talk to me a little bit about that process. We, so we did a little bit of that at the beginning. And then as we grew bigger, I had designated trainer. Okay. And so I, I, I was fortunate. I had the best team in the world. I had some of the smartest men and women to work with me. Um, they did an incredible job of help, helping develop those, you know, uh, operating procedures that we had. Um, they had, you know, they would sit down with these, we'd open up this new office. They would sit down for the first, you know, 90 days holding these people's hands saying, this is how we're going to do it. This is why we do it. Let's get you on board with it. And they would do those things. So we had, depending on the position, I mean, I, I ended up starting a dental assisting school because I was tired of, of hiring assistants and then training them on the job. And I'm like, well, why don't, why don't I just have my assistant who knows what she's doing, get paid to train these people. Right. You know, and so those, are, those are very lucrative too. I, I actually have one in my practice on Saturdays. Uh -huh. I make a, a little bit less than a thousand dollars a month just having someone use my practice on days that I'm not using it. Yeah, that, which which is great. Yeah. We had, uh, you know, the in fact we sold our dental assisting school when I sold everything off. Um, that my main assistant, she took it and ran with it. Right. Uh, our gross revenues on that were about one hundred eighty thousand mm -hmm. a year. Yeah, yeah. I imagine. Uh, that's. Yeah, very plus, profitable. Plus we, got amazing, plus, we got amazing assistance from it. Yeah, you got the creme de la creme. You got to pick, pick out a pick out of the pick of the litter, so to speak. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that this is pretty good for a Meet the Experts episode. Um, this is, of course, your first episode where people are going to get to know you, and we're going to go through TBOD. We're going to find different topics. Uh, heck, there was one this week that would probably be great for you, uh, and I'm sure you'll have something to say about that one in in specificity in our next podcast episode. But um, for now, I just want to thank you for coming on and, and giving of your time and your knowledge to our members and, and to myself. Well, Doc, you're great. I, I really appreciate it. Um, you know, I'm just a guy with another opinion. Uh, you know, I, I, it, it worked for me just because it worked for me in certain areas doesn't necessarily mean it's going to always work for everybody else. But I, I like to feel that, you know, my results speak for themselves. And, uh, you know, we had, a, we had a good run. And I, I'm very excited to what the next thing is to come. And, I'm more than willing to help anybody out, uh, you know, with whatever they can need and uh, ha happy to certainly do that for them. So, um, well, you know what they say, opinions are like assholes and everyone has an opinion. Everyone has one, right? Mm -hmm. But some pieces of people's assholes are stopped up and don't work. It's all those <laughs> constipated people constantly putting their opinions out there to just tick me off. Yeah. that's a <laughs> Well, I, I, any, anything, I mean, is worth listening to. I don't, you know, uh, I'm going to leave that one untouched. I, I deal with this. End of the, uh, this is my part of the digestive tract. If you, if you want to go down there, it's all you, man. I, 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 finally, I finally managed to throw you off your pace. Yeah. All right, my friend. Joe, thank, thank you, you again for joining us. Guys, thank you for joining us for another episode of the Dear Doc Podcast. Um, and thank you for wasting another perfectly good hour listening to the sound of my voice. I hope that we see you again soon. Have a great day. Thanks, Doc. Thanks for listening to the Dear Doc Podcast, your source for the business and legal questions associated with your dental practice. Don't forget to subscribe to the Dear Doc Podcast on all major platforms.